Meanwhile, remember earlier in the week, Ray Dalio was saying that cash is trash. We've actually heard him say that line a couple of times before. This time, investors heeded his call. B of A strategists putting out this some data, fascinating data that showed, according to Michael Hartnett, there has been a monster reallocation in cash to stocks. Apparently, we're not worrying so much about tax freeze distribution right now, and the Fed is expected to remain Wall Street friendly next week. So all of this is as, of course, we've seen the data showing about $60 billion worth came out of ETFs to track cash, went into stocks primarily, about $51 billion worth. So, well, people are putting the money to work, even though the market is currently going on the downhill, Romain. Yeah, you're definitely seeing that. Let's bring in David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer for the Bonson Group, has about $3 billion in assets under management. David, always a uh, wonderful to see your face and always wonderful uh, to get your thoughts here. Uh, I would like to get your thoughts here on this pullback, and that's really all of it is right now. I mean, we're down about 2% or so from that all-time high on the S&P 500 set uh, back in early September. But this isn't exactly the massive correction that some people seem to think that we need. No, I mean, it's not even close to it, really. And you're talking about now, I believe, 10 times that the S&P has drawn down, about 2% since last October, and all 10 times it's kind of bounced off of it. In some cases, it's done so within 24 or 48 hours. So the, the market's resilience through very modest drawdowns has been quite strong for some time. What's driving that resilience? Is it people coming in, putting cash to work, or is it just FOMO? Well, it's a combination of things. There is an awful lot of liquidity. In the grand scheme of things, cash that comes off the sideline into the market is actually a pretty small percentage. I think uh, there's been a lot of money redeployed from fixed income, and, and I think there's a lot of new money that has come into the market. But one of the most underappreciated factors is global investors. They're not happy with the return environment in Europe, with the global geopolitical stability, and the U.S. has still been a very attractive place to invest, both on the equity side and even on the fixed income side. We, we look at our Treasury yields and think they're paltry and underwhelming, but of course, they're actually at a premium to, to yen-based and euro-based uh, sovereign debt. <laughs> They're positive. It's more than you can say for most in terms of yields when you're looking at Europe. I'm, if we're talking on nominal basis. Talk to us about the tax question, David, because that was something that the Bank of America strategists were talking about, the fact that that risk to investing from a tax inver uh, take perspective is actually reducing quite significantly. Do you see that at the moment? Yeah, I think it's very interesting the way the market has responded to tax and political and legislative risk all year versus the way some various pundits in the political class and, and oftentimes even analysts on Wall Street have. Um, I, it seems to me the market seems to know something. It's something I've talked to my clients about over and over again since before the election that, that a lot have forgotten, and that is how difficult it is to change law and to raise taxes in our system of government. Now, I happen to say that as a good thing. I know there's some people that may view it more negatively, but the sort of Madisonian system, the separation of powers, the different branches of government, the way they have to work together, and we make analogies to sausage making, the fact of the matter is that raising taxes is a lot harder than making sausage. And what we now see is that some of the worst case scenarios people talked about that the market never priced in for good reason. They were never going to happen. There was never going to be a 44 percent capital gain rate and, and they were never going to get away with taxing unrealized gains when somebody passes away. Those things were in the bill. They're, they are probably on the agenda of some progressives, but there's too many moderates and too many Republicans in a 50-50 Senate and a three-vote lead in the House, there's just nowhere near the political mandate to get some of those more radical things that truly yeah. would hurt markets yeah. done. And that's what I think the market is priced. Yeah, absolutely. And it's always kind of hard to game sort of uh, some of the rhetoric coming out of uh, the halls of Congress and the White House. Uh, let's go down, I guess, the road here uh, to the Eccles building in Washington. Of course, we're going to get uh, the uh, big FOMC uh, committee meeting next week here. And while we're not necessarily expecting an announcement on the taper, we are expecting them to talk about it and maybe Maybe uh, set up an announcement for later this year. What are your expectations, David? Uh, my expectations are for what you said. We're going to get some talking, and we're going to get some talking about talking. And uh, I think the Fed has told us in the clearest English possible exactly what they're going to do. 
uh, which is that come December, they're going to let us know that they're going to start tapering into January. So they talked about, talked about, you know, and so I could go on with this point. At the end of the day, they're not going to surprise markets. And I'm surprised by how many market actors are worried about being surprised. It's off the table. Uh, and by the way, any Fed governor not named Jay Powell can say whatever they want as well. They have baked into market expectation, which is evidence both in yields and in equities, that they are going to start a very modest tapering into Q1 of next year, not sooner. They didn't need Delta as an excuse. They didn't need a bad unemployment number. That was what their plan was all along. And one thing I'll add about this, I didn't realize till, till this week, um, when they do start tapering and that comes down a bit in the level of bond buying, even after tapering, the absolute level of bond purchases is going to be higher than at any of the QE1, 2, and 3 levels that we were seeing month by month back post-financial crisis. So I recognize tapering is a form of tightening, but some tightening mm -hmm. is a little more stringent than others. David Bunsen, great to have some time with you, Chief Investment Officer of Bunsen Group. Stay well. Have a happy weekend.